Yo, yo, what up? This is Raphael with NBA Draft Junkies. And in this episode, I am going to debut my big board 1.0. But this is only the top 10 picks. Hopefully you enjoy it. If you like the channel, if you like the content, please subscribe. Hit the like and notification button to get all the updates. All right, here we go. Starting off with number one. Paolo Bancaro is the number one player on my big board right now. And coming into the season, I had Chet Holmgren as my number one. But I've changed my mind. As of today, Ben Carroll is the guy. And he's he's been so good this season that we're actually starting to hear people nitpick and talk about his lack of upside. And he may not be the best long-term prospect. And other prospects have, you know, a better long-term potential. And I think once you get to that point, that means there's really nothing to, you know, there's nothing negative about his game. It's kind of like I mean, we heard it with Luca, and I mean, Luca ended up falling because people thought that he didn't have the the best long term projection or, or whatever. And I think Ben Carroll is slowly starting to get to that stage because you can't knock his game. There's nothing you, that you can say about what he's done on the floor. I mean, you can say that he's missed some time with with cramps or whatever, but you can't pick anything on the floor and say that there is a better prospect right now in college basketball than Ben Carroll and I, mean, I think he's the most ready to come in and contribute right away and so when, once you start hearing you know about his his lack of upside on a, a 19 year old then that that's when you know he's dominating because there's absolutely nothing else to say all right at number two I have Chet Holmgren who was my number one until about a week ago and Holmgren has been good but he hasn't been dominant through nine games he's shown the flashes of why he was so highly regarded he's tough he's competitive and we know that he struggles with physicality because he's only a buck 95 but the biggest concern for me so far is that his jump shot has literally abandoned him he is only four for 17 on jump shots and one of his his strengths coming into this season was that he was a seven footer that had guard skills and that could shoot not saying that he can't shoot but right now he's really struggled on his jump shots but he's making up for it by shooting a blistering 94.7 percent at the rim and he's also blocking nearly four shots per game but here's something i thought was very very interesting he played against Alabama this weekend, which was, I mean, shout out to Nate Oates in Alabama for taking that game. It's supposed to be a road game, but the game was in Seattle. And he seemed like he was, I mean, getting benched is probably a strong word, but he only played 22 minutes. There were times late in the game where he wasn't on the floor. I don't know what all that was about, but I thought it was very interesting that he only played 22 minutes. So right now, Ben Carroll has passed him on my board. But if he can get the jumper falling, there could be a chance for another switch. But based off of what I've seen right now, Ben Carroll is the best prospect in college basketball. All right, at number three, I have Jabari Smith. And coming into this season, I had some concerns about Jabari Smith. I I'll be totally honest with you. I thought he settled for too many jumpers. I thought his game was very predictable. I... I saw the talent, I just wasn't totally convinced. I mean, I thought he was going to be at least a top 10 pick, but I, didn't, I did not think he would be this good. And he has been a lot better than advertised. He's quieted my concerns. And like I said, I knew he could put the ball on the floor. I knew he could shoot, but I didn't know he was a shooter shooter. I didn't know he was a sniper. He's currently shooting 43.9% from deep. And this is on five attempts per game, so it's not like it's it's a small sample size. His ball handling has also been better than advertised. And his shooting has opened up opportunities for him to attack closeouts and drive by defenders facing up. And like I said, though it's only a small sample size, it's only been eight attempts. But I like what I'm seeing out of the post. That was one of my concerns. I didn't think he posted up enough. I thought he just was too reliant on, on jump shots. I thought he was kind of like a... And I mean, when I say this, I know people are going to frown and roll their eyes. But the games I saw of him in high school, he literally played like Channing Fry. Like he was just a pick and pop. You know, I mean, he showed a little bit more skill set than Channing Fry, but it just seemed like all he did was shoot three. So it's only been eight attempts, but I like what I'm seeing out of the post. That was probably like one of my biggest concerns was that he didn't post up enough. He was more so a pick and pop guy. 
But now that his body's feeling out, he's getting a little stronger, especially in his lower body. He seems to be a little bit more comfortable on the block. And so that is very, very encouraging. And just in, in my opinion, and, and I probably am in the consensus here, but I feel like the top three picks in this draft are in their own tier. And at number four, that's where it kind of turns into a crapshoot. So at number four, I have Jaden Ivey. Now, there may be some debate on which position that he plays, but for me, I've just labeled him as a ball player. I've mentioned it before on previous podcasts that he reminds me of Russell Westbrook. Now, I know Westbrook is such a divisive player like people don't like rust he's getting blamed for the lakers struggles this year no matter whether you like him or not hate his game you think he's too wild or whatever russell westbrook is a hall of famer and he's going to go down as one of the best players in nba history i'm not saying Jaden ivy is going to have the same success as westbrook but he reminds me of westbrook with his athleticism the competitive fire the the motor you know what he brings to the table like literally pops out on every possession like his motor is constantly running and he just impacts the game just with his athleticism and energy and just how hard he plays and i think how hard a player plays and and their motor is a very underrated skill set i think it's actually a skill so another reason why he reminds me of westbrook is because he's an excellent rebounder for guard he's averaging like I want to say like around six rebounds per game. He's a solid passer. And like Westbrook, he gets a lot of his assists on driving kicks. And he's able to get those driving kick assists because nobody can really stop him from getting into the paint. So I think that at four, it's maybe a little high for some. But I just think that that the way the NBA is going with his speed and the pressure that he can put on defenses, especially with the spread NBA floor and screens, I think that he could be a really impactful player. And just right now, it just looks like the gamble of returning for his sophomore season is paying off big time because, like I said, right now I got him as as a top five pick. So um, Jaden Ivey at number four. All right, at number five, and this is where it's a little bit of a surprise. I'm going with Kendall Brown. Now, Kendall Brown didn't have much not even top 10 hype. I mean, I saw him as a first round pick, but I didn't think he had a lot of top 10 hype entering his freshman season. But for me personally, it just took eight games for me to put him in my top five. Now, the, the NBA is, is, I mean, the NBA is always in need of versatile wings and Kendall Brown has all of the tools. He's 6'8". He is an elite athlete like when i say elite athlete he is one of the best athletes in this draft he can defend multiple positions he can make plays for others he gets most of his points off energy plays cuts to the rim and in transition but he's been uber efficient he's making 72 percent of his shots now the the question is his shooting he's a very very reluctant shooter he's only taken 12 jump shots this season but the percentages are encouraging as he's converted 41.7% of his jumpers. I like him as a connective tissue, freaky athletic glue guy that when he develops like a corner three or a set shot, I think that he's going to be a very impactful player. I don't know if he's going to be like a superstar, but I just think that he has all the tools to where he could end up being a better NBA player than than college player. Kendall Brown from Baylor, that is probably the biggest jump at number five. But then again, at number six, I have one for you. I'm going with J.D. Davison at number six, the point guard from Alabama. Like I said, I know this may be a surprise, but I was actually thinking of putting him in my top 10 before the Gonzaga game, despite the fact that he doesn't even start for Alabama. But he's been good. And after the performance this weekend, I moved him to number six on my board. First and foremost, before I even get into like the intangibles, I must say that I'm very impressed with how well that he's handled the six man role. I mean, he was a highly regarded recruit, could have went to almost any other school in the country and started, but he chose to go to Alabama. Knowing that the starting position wasn't a guarantee and right now he's coming off the bench and he has just handled his role well, which to me says a lot about his character 
and his commitment to winning over gaudy numbers and you know his draft stock so shout out to jd davison for for accepting that role but if kendall brown isn't the best athlete or if Jaden Ivey isn't the best athlete, then you probably have J.D. Davison as the best athlete in your... I mean, there's there's guys that are crazy, freaky athletes. But as far as, like, first-round talents, and what I like about Davison, what he's done in his new role at Alabama, is he's made the most of it. Now, I knew he was a scorer. I knew he got buckets. I knew he was a freaky athlete. But what he's shown me is that he's a better passer than I thought. And his ability to play off the ball has, um, I think, helped his draft stock. He's knocking down threes at a high rate. I think he's shooting 38% from three, which is, I mean, very good. Like, I had him, I guess I want to say I had him labeled as a scorer, like a high usage scorer. Now, that hasn't been his role, and he's made the most of it. So, that's why I'm so high on him. And like Jaden Ivey, he is a strong rebounder. And he's just someone that I think NBA scouts have to be drooling over the thought of this this great athlete like Davidson operating out of pick and roll with NBA spacing. Right now he's averaging about a little under 10, 5 and 5 a game or like 9, 4 and 4. And I imagine if he played 28, 29, 30 minutes per game, he could be one of the guys that would be a threat to put up a triple double. And I actually wouldn't be surprised if he ends up getting a triple double this season. So JD Davidson, I have him at number six all right at number seven this also might be a surprise kennedy chandler i'm just a big fan of kennedy chandler what he's done and i i like what he brings to the table yes i understand that he's small he doesn't have the same physical attributes as Jaden ivy or jd davidson but he gets the job done he's pesky on defense he's been efficient putting the ball in the basket He's boasting 52, 42, 83 shooting splits through eight games. He's averaging close to five assists per game, despite not really being the full-time ball handler. And then on defense, he, coming into this weekend, he was averaging 2.7 steals per game. He had one game where he had seven steals, and I actually did a video breakdown on him. He has more dunks than some of the, the guys that are like 10 inches taller than him that are projected top 10 picks. And I made a mistake. I said he had two dunks, but he actually has three dunks, which, you know, for a guy that's six foot, getting dunks in games is, is <laughs> a lot more difficult than, than people give credit for. So Kennedy Chandler at number seven. All right, rounding out the last three prospects that I want to talk about to finish out my top 10, I'll begin with... Jaden Hardy. Man, these Jadens and Jalens, it is so confusing. I feel like every year there's a Jaden or Jalen, maybe even two or three of them in the first round of every draft. Anyway, Jaden Hardy, who's playing for the G League Ignite, was largely considered the crown jewel of the G League Ignite's recruiting class. But recently, he's been overshadowed by just the ultra freakishly talented scoot henderson who i i mean if you haven't had a chance to listen to my colleague chat Ford, him and howard beck had a great podcast on scoot henderson they actually compared him to the next kobe i did a video breakdown i have an article on my nba draft junkies.com website on scoot henderson who has just been absolutely phenomenal which has kind of dimmed the light a little bit on Jaden hardy Hardy had the reputation as a, a big time scorer that had the upside of being able to play point guard. And there were some people, I mentioned this with Chad, Chad Ford a few months back, some people thought he was a dark horse candidate to go number one. And so far, Hardy's introduction to pro basketball has been a lot, a lot tougher than expected as he's only shooting 33% from the floor and 28% from three. I was someone that I, I liked his scoring potential. I thought he was a big time shot maker. I thought he was a relentless gunner. I was never a fan of his shot selection, um, even though like he has the ability to shoot from NBA range. And he's been shooting NBA threes at, I mean, I guess for like two, three years now. He was just someone that I felt like at best is like this streaky shooter that, that can definitely fill it up and get buckets. I didn't know if he was ever going to hone his game into being like this playmaker. And so far, I mean, he's, he's still young. So far, I haven't really seen 
the playmaking ability that other people have talked about, which is crazy to me that he is a projected top 10 pick while a guy like Cam Thomas fell late in the first round. And the only reason why is because some people think Hardy has a better upside as a passer, but I think that Hardy might be more of Cam Thomas than people have given him credit for. And Cam Thomas has been phenomenal in the G League. I mean, he's just a big, big time scorer. So I think right now people are caught in the, and they, they like the idea of trying to turn Jaden Hardy into a point guard or a lead guard. Right now it's early, but I don't see it. I just think he's more comfortable with being a, a gunner, like a hired gun, somebody that's gonna put up buckets and shoot a lot of shots and, and make tough step backs and, and, and so on. I still think he goes into the top 10 because teams are going to you know, bet on that he can develop into a playmaker. I have Jaden Hardy at number eight. Just got to make sure I don't get his name mixed up with the next prospect who I want to talk about, who I have at number nine. It is Jalen Duren. And here's a question that I have to ask myself. Would Jalen Duren be ranked higher if he had a legitimate point guard feeding him the rock? That's, you know, a very valid question. I personally am not a big fan of Imani Bates the whole Imani Bates point guard experiment. Now, I like Imani Bates. I am a fan of Imani Bates overall. I just don't like the experiment of turning him into a point guard. I just don't think that is who he is. And trying Imani at the point may or maybe not, but it, it could have had an impact on Duran's draft stock. Now, I have to remind myself that Duran is, you know, he's 18. He's the youngest prospect. In the draft he's still supposed to be in high school so maybe maybe i should cut him a little bit more slack but to me he's still a little unpolished on the offensive end of the floor and his motor hasn't it just hasn't been as consistent as i thought now this is the guy that does most of his damage on the offensive glass and just being bigger stronger and more physical than just about everybody he matches up against which is kind of crazy when you consider that he is still supposed to be in high school. I mean, he has the body of, I wouldn't even want to say a grown man because grown men don't even have the same strength and physicality of, of Jalen Duran. But he's been compared to Dwight Howard. And in order for him to live up to the baby Dwight Howard comparisons, he'll need to crank up his engine a little bit more. He just hasn't been as active as I thought. He's had some, some disappointing games against some highly ranked teams, but I still think at 18 with a 7-3 wingspan. He's been very good on the defensive end as far as protecting the rim. I still think he ends up being a top 10 pick. All right, rounding out my top 10, I have one of my favorite players, and I'll admit that I can be a little bit biased towards John Montero. I've been following him for a few years now, and I, I mean, the minute I saw him, I thought he was a special talent. I thought he was worthy of being a lottery pick in whatever draft he came out of. And this is a despite that there are some concerns. I mean, I haven't had him as much, but there are some concerns about his size, his length, and his defined NBA position. Some don't think he's a point guard. and Some think he's too small to be a, a two. I remember um, in 2020, I saw him at Basketball Without Borders, and uh, there was an agent, a very powerful NBA agent, and I saw him at the Basketball Without Borders event, and I said, hey, I think this Montero kid is special. I thought he was the best player there, and Josh Giddy was also playing in that, in that particular tournament. And he said, man, I don't know about his size. He didn't know about the athleticism, yada, yada, yada. So I even did a whole video breakdown, and I sent it to this agent explaining why I thought Montero was going to be a lottery pick. And I think it was, so this was 2020, so this was almost two years ago. And he still didn't see it, but now I think he's coming along to the fact that Montero is a, a guy that, I mean, he may not pass the eye test as far as like physical attributes, but he is a special score. He just has a, a great pace to his game. Now, I expected him to shine in this whole overtime elite situation. It's their inaugural season. It's in the best interest for him as the, the face of the program to, to play well, which he's, he's done. I mean, he, he's done what I've expected him to do. So far, it hasn't hurt his draft stock, and I thought it was kind of risky on his part because, 
it could have i thought maybe it could have hurt his draft stock because he's playing against guys that are younger and he's not playing against the same competition as the players that are in college basketball or in the g league but it doesn't seem to have to have hurt i think that um the overtime elite games from a scouting perspective aren't as easier like for example i can watch college basketball or g league or even international games on synergy and get some advanced stats i mean you have to really put in some time and work to find overtime elite stats so um that can be a little bit difficult to gauge but overall i think gene montero or john montero has has played well i have him as a top 10 pick